Uh, I think it's people actually. Like all bugs and vulnerabilities out there either come from like misconfiguration or like uh, missed best practices in software. So at the end of the day, it all boils down to, uh, to people. There is a lot of things you can do to help them be secure because they, we can expect that they don't really know why it's security, right? Uh, so one thing could be to offer like a two-factor authentication in the sign-in flow just to, you know, have them be more, stay more secure. Uh, it could be a good idea on the sign up to recommend if the, them to use, say, a, a password manager, like uh, one pass or a last pass or something similar. And as we've all heard, like a lot of websites have been hacked recently and database credentials have leaked. Uh, so criminals take advantage of this. They will take credentials from one location and try them at somewhere else in the hopes of gaining more information about people for you know, blackmailing or planting ransomware or whatnot. Do you have an incident response plan? Do you, do you know if it's actually fulfilled? Like, does it work in, in practice if something blows up, for example? It's easy to write stuff on a paper, but it's an entirely different thing to actually act on it. Uh, same goes with backups. I think most people have heard it, but it's very easy to take backups, but do, do you, have you actually tried to restore them and do you know that that is working? It's always easy to squeeze in another feature into a service, but maybe it doesn't really belong there. Maybe this service will grow too much and become too complex and then it's very easy to like, lose the grasp of what's possible to do with this service. Maybe, maybe you have a bunch of systems. Some systems shouldn't be exposed to other ones if they're, it's not intended to talk it to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you can separate it by like the network and so forth. Uh, firewalls, you know. I mean, common sense, really. Uh, do this service have to have SSH exposed to the internet? Is it okay to only expose it to, say, the office? Or can you even like solve it using a VPN tunnel so nothing is exposed to the internet? I try to find all domains belonging to an organization, what uh, network ranges they own, and uh, well, basically do a recon process trying to find all assets that are exposed out there. Uh, once that's done, uh, I do the next natural step, a port scan all the IPs, see what is actually exposed, uh, what websites, what services, what APIs, maybe you can find some exposed database, then <laughs> that's usually very bad. Uh, and as I'm specializing in web security, then every web interface I find, I try to hack them like individually. So say you have a WordPress blog somewhere, uh, it's forgotten, it's not in use, it's still residing on a subdomain, and you find a reflected access flow that's like, all right, here is a vulnerability. A business impact is like none, because this site is not even in use. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and usually that's what you see in pen test reports. But then say I stumble upon, say, gitlab.company.com on another subdomain, uh, and I know GitLab uses cookies for uh, authorization, then all of a sudden this reflected access on the blog can be uh, utilized to get the cookies from GitLab, and all of a sudden you have like a, a chain of events that could result in source code to leak. So finding bugs on its own, it's a bit of a puzzle. Like I, I get motivated by finding individual bugs and then trying to put them together into a chain, basically. Uh, you could see it a bit like a Sudoku puzzle or a, or a normal puzzle, really, where each and every bug and flaw I find is like a puzzle piece. Um, that's really something, it's like a sport. If I manage to combine these flaws, then can I make the system behave in another way than what's expected? And it's, I get like a rush if I'm the first one to find it at some place that no one else has thought about. But really what's most important is to have a responsible disclosure policy. Uh, the difference between a bug bounty and a responsible disclosure policy is that 
a responsible disclosure policy is basically just a way for me as an individual out on the internet to submit uh, vulnerability information to a company uh, without like uh, risking a lawsuit against me. Uh, so usually me, uh, other developers, other security professionals uh, find flaws on systems but usually like you say it like huh, yeah here, here's a flaw but I don't really dare to report it because you never know what happens. Is it really worth it? Uh, so then you there, yeah, then you skip doing that. But if I know there is a responsible disclosure policy, then of course I will send it away. The only thing you really need is like a, some page somewhere saying like any vulnerability you can send to security at company.com. That's it. Of course, you need to be able to handle these uh, vulnerabilities you get. Uh, so you need to set up some procedures, maybe put up a Hall of Fame site to, to show or, or like to how should I say, uh, highlight the researchers that have reported vulnerabilities to you to give something back. It doesn't have to be anything other than that, really. If that's working, it's working fine for you, then it might be worth taking the next step of doing a proper bug bounty, uh, which means paying for vulnerabilities. You'll get an entirely different pressure on your platforms because people are motivated by money, usually. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's the next logical step thereafter.